Well, the first thing is I don't think anyone should be normal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of our monks he used to say, those who are now considered normal accept the values and principles of an insane world. At the end of this life, people won't remember us for what we did. People won't remember us for our achievements. People won't remember us for our percentage in a test or our position in a ranking or our power in society. People will remember us for who we were, the qualities that we exuded, the character that we um, cultivated in our life that touched their hearts. And so, what the ancient spiritual teachers tell us is, along with having a to-do list, have a to-be list. Before we talk about failure, first we have to know what is success. If people have the wrong definition of success, then they will also have the wrong definition of failure. According to spiritualists, success is not in the result. Success is not in the achievement. Success is not what you, you get at the end. That's not what defines success. According to spiritual teachings, success is in your endeavor, your intention, your effort, the character that goes behind the noble thing that you're trying to do. And once you've invested all of those things, whatever the result may be, is actually inconsequential, it's already a success. Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you for making it. Today we've assembled here, of course, at this wonderful institution called UCL, University College London. Well, first of all, a very warm welcome to everyone here from UCL, from our uni. Hopefully you didn't have too much trouble finding this building. It's called Bentham House, of course, named after the great Jeremy Bentham, who is kind of statue. Is that a statue you see in the student center? Same guy. So that's Bentham House for you. And I know our guest has some strong opinions about Jeremy Bentham, so we'll ask him <laughs> about that later. But we also have students from many unis here, which UCL folks you might have been rejected from, or you might have kept as a backup. So not only in London, but across the UK, I, I'm especially grateful to people who've traveled in all the way and come, and who are still coming, 6.38. But, and thank you for waiting, and thank you to all who came on time. Very warm welcome to all of you. And finally, uh, a warm welcome to all our guests who are either too old or too young to be at uni but still landed up. <laughs> but jokes apart, we're very, very honored and pleased to have you. And please do enjoy our hospitality. And thank you so much for coming. Talking about UCL, of course, one thing which stands out is its alumni. We put this in the marketing as well. Christopher Nolan studied here, Gandhi studied here, David Attenborough studied here, etc., etc., etc. So many wonderful people. But today we have another alumnus with us who's come back to UCL for the first time in 18 years or 20 years, if I'm not wrong. And believe it or not, this man here graduated with a BSc in Information Management in 2002 and then joined the most competitive grad scheme which exists, Monk School. <laughs> Since then, he's written 10 books, mentored hundreds, traveled around the world, taught at unis, government bodies and corporates and is on a mission to show how ancient wisdom is indeed eternally relevant. Folks, please join me in welcoming back to his uni for this wonderful conversation, which is set to begin. The monk who studied at UCL, the one and only His Holiness, S.B. Keshava Swami. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Your Holiness, being with us today. We were on a tour this afternoon, just going around UCL, reminiscing about the various places His Holiness used to go to. You want to share something, anything stood out to you? Yeah, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. It's a real honor to be back at UCL. And yeah, as uh, we were walking around with Mukund this afternoon, it was like a trip down memory lane. Uh, so many experiences, so many memories. I, I was studying here in 1999. That's when I began. Um, I was an 18 year old, idealistic, 
student uh, who wanted to study philosophy uh, but ended up doing something a bit more practical management and uh, and and yeah UCL was a real journey for me so it's been amazing to come back here and really excited for this evening to to spend this time with all of you and hopefully as Mukun said share some wisdom and explore yeah some of the things that maybe the academic uh, world doesn't always uh, discuss so openly mm -hmm. No, for sure. And I'm pretty sure our audience here also has a lot of questions for you. So the way this will work is, of course, I prepared like six, eight pages, but I won't bore everyone with that. We'll eventually open it up to all of you and would love for you to ask any questions you might have. And I think a good place to start is therefore the beginning of your journey, your life journey, which starts at UCL. For the folks who've come from elsewhere, I won't make it too much about UCL, but I think UCL is a great place to start just because you've come back. But uh, I've also learned from you and other spiritualists, the journey should start with some kind of prayer or contemplation or a kind of invocation, which I believe you like to do at the start of any talks you give as well. So now is the time, if you would kindly like to. And also one request is if you could please explain the meaning of what you're saying, because all that Greek and Latin, rather Sanskrit, uh, <laughs> doesn't make sense to us anymore. So if you could please lead us yes. in that little prayer. Yeah, before we begin any kind of spiritual discussion, we often begin with a prayer. I say that prayer is something like digestion, like you can eat so much, but only when you just sit and digest it, do you number one, get the full benefit of everything you've put in your body. And number two, the other benefit of digestion is you open up room to put more in. Um, so I think prayers of gratitude are something like that. They're an opportunity to reflect on everything that we've received. Um, particularly from those who came before us and to reflect on that and to pay homage to that so that we can gain the full benefit of it and then open our hearts to receive more. So I'm just going to chant a couple of Sanskrit prayers and um, the meaning is just an offer of respect and appreciation for everything that those who have come before us have given to us to mm -hmm. allow us to do what we want to do in our journey. So you're all welcome to join me. You can uh, close your eyes and you can just think of uh, one thing that you're grateful for that your predecessors gifted to you so that your journey in this life um, has been a, a, a fruitful one. Om Ajnanati Mirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun militam yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vashadigaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you, Thank you so much, Your Holiness. That's really going to set the mood for us as we start this conversation. And now on a lighter note, obviously starting on a lighter segment, we've got a few images here we'd like to show you. These are memes, courtesy of London Tab and memes of UCL. Just to show you what's going on here and get your opinions on that, if that's okay. So the first one we've got is basically unis being compared to lines on the tube. So UCLs compared to the central line. Do you agree? Do I agree? Yeah, busy, uh, lots of rats. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, usually lots of trains and uh, yeah, lots of services there, yeah. Which line did you take? Did you take the tube when you used to come? I lived at Ramsey Hall in my first year here. Anyone here from Ramsey? <laughs> I um, see a few faces okay, a few faces. going down in dejection. <laughs> so Mitra there. <laughs> but um, in my second year and third year, I was living at home. Uh, home was Wembley. So I, I used to come in on the Jubilee line from Wembley Park and then 
the Met Line from Finchley Road to Euston Square. Okay. That was my wow. daily trip. And how crowded was it? Anything uh, you observed? I see, you, you spoke about rats. I've seen one image you once shared in one of your other presentations, how it's like rats falling all over the place. Like you compared people to rats? Yeah, the, the, I, I remember once coming in on the tube, uh, coming into university and, and, and just having this kind of image of, you know, the rat race and how all these people coming down the escalator was, were just in the kind of the race of life and, and really just going nowhere fast. Mm. And so the tube, I always found coming in on the tube was a very reflective time to really question like, what do I want my journey to be? What do I want to do? Where do I want to... Uh, take my life, you know. Uh, so I don't think about anything on the tube except how late I am for my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so you said Wembley Park, that means North West London. So you're brown, Gujarati, North West London. I think that's pretty many people here. Anyone here, brown and North West London? Yeah, a lot of hands going up. So, um, and even if some people are, they're not going to say. But I can assure you, you have a bright future. His Holiness is a living example. <laughs> You have a bright future ahead. But how was childhood for you, talking about where you come from, your family? Were you always spiritual growing up? I guess I grew up in a family which uh, had like spiritual culture or religious culture, probably tradition. Mm -hmm. But we weren't overly religious. I didn't study any books. I didn't explore any philosophy. But I guess I did come into this world. Now I look with it, look, look at it in hindsight with certain tendencies. Hmm. According to Vedic literature, this uh, life we're living right now is just a chapter of a longer story and we've lived lives before. And therefore we come into this world with something called samskaras. This is a Sanskrit word, which means impressioning, impressions or conditionings or personality traits. So from a young age, I was always kind of attracted towards minimalism, simplicity, uh, I felt extremely stressed out if I had even one more thing um, than was absolutely necessary. Mm. So although I wasn't deeply spiritual, I had a very much a leaning towards uh, living a simple life. Mm. Wow. So talking about simplicity, your degree name is quite the opposite, Information Management for Business. Curious to know, why did you choose that? And are you really smart or what were your conditional <laughs> offers like? <laughs> I, um, well, the, you were talking about getting rejected from other universities. So, <laughs> so on my UCAS form, I think my other universities were Warwick. Funnily enough, I was at Warwick yesterday um, <laughs> to study management as well. I also applied to King's College. I applied to Brunel uh, and uh, another couple of unis I can't remember. Um, if I'm honest, the first choice is I wanted to go King's College, oh, no. but I got rejected from King's uh, Management Science. So Information Management at UCL was the second, the second choice. Uh -huh. I got an A and two Bs, so I made it in. And um, why did I choose management? As I said to you before, actually, by the time I was 17, 18, I was studying more philosophy. So I actually wanted to study philosophy at university. But my parents convinced me to do something that would get me a proper job. And so I decided to study information management to keep them happy. And we'll discuss how you actually kept them happy or not later. <laughs> yeah. But you mentioned King's College London, and I'm pretty sure you know how UCL and KCL feel towards each other. What's yeah. your thoughts on the friendship between UCL and KCL? <laughs> To be honest, I'm totally out of touch with uh, the relationships between these universities. Uh, of course, UCL does have a, an amazing tradition because it's actually said to be the first secular university in the country, mm -hmm. whereas King's is a theologically based university. One historian actually called UCL the godless institution on Gower Street. Um, oh. And uh, Jeremy Bentham set it up as a non-religiously uh, denomination university but uh but yeah i think uh i think relationships are better nowadays and that's jeremy bentham we on a little tour we did yeah you call it in sanskrit darshan you know taking sight of something we took darshan of jeremy bentham yeah 
<laughs> yeah, Jeremy Bentham's philosophy is interesting. He had a philosophy called utilitarianism. I don't know if any of you are familiar, but Jeremy Bentham's kind of famous line was that we should do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Mm -hmm. And when I was a, a student here in my first year and I was meeting the other monks, then I, uh, I was speaking to one of the monks and he asked me about the philosophy of Jeremy Bentham. So I said, yeah, his philosophy is utilitarianism. We should, we should do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And I thought that was extremely noble. And this uh, monk looked at me and he said, we believe in doing the ultimate good for all people. And, uh, and he explained about how we can take Jeremy Bentham's philosophy of wanting to actually make a positive contribution to the world, but we can take it higher and we can take it further and we can take it broader if we add spirituality to the equation. So mm. definitely got some things from Jeremy Bentham and have tried to build on it through the years. <laughs> Love that. Thank you. So student centers, of course, next to the Bloomsbury Theatre building, which we also went to home of societies. And you were mentioning how you were part of societies at uni and freshers fairs, etc. So any memories, anything about societies, this event also, of course, organized by a couple of societies at UCL. How was society? Well, of course, like the there? society I obviously remember when I was at university was the KC stock, the Krishna Consciousness Society, because in my first year, um, the president who was on his way out decided that there was no one else to become the next president and so <laughs> kind of honorarily awarded me that title of becoming the president and at that time the society was actually very small so I ended up becoming the president the treasurer and the secretary and the welfare officer <laughs> uh, all to basically just take care of myself because there was no one else in the society um, but we had many adventures uh -huh. in the Krishna consciousness society in my years here I remember we, we once invited um, a humanist philosopher and did a debate on the existence of God in the archaeology theater. Mm -hmm. uh, we went past the anatomy lecture theater today and we did an interesting event there where we took a hundred students on a past life regression into their previous life. Oh, wow. Um, uh, it was the first and last event we did like that. Um, we also, just down the road from the Anatomy Lecture Theatre, we did an amazing event at the Darwin Lecture Theatre, where we decided to invite someone called Michael Cremo, who had written a book called Forbidden Archaeology. And he had basically uncovered all of this evidence in the world, which actually goes contrary to the prevailing theory of Darwin and evolution. And uh, he was explaining how when all this evidence comes to light, this archaeological evidence, it's actually filtered out of the mainstream because it doesn't corroborate with the prevailing theory. So mm. he came to present all of this forbidden archaeology. So it was quite a controversy. And the UCL authorities even tried to pull the event uh, one week before, but oh, we wow. managed to take it through. And so, yeah, I have a lot of good memories here of things, things that happened and events we did. And, and just by the number of events you organized and the size and scale makes me feel so underachieving for us and our committee because you were alone. We've literally done this one and I'm like three months away from graduating. <laughs> so, <laughs> but very inspiring. Thank you. So obviously we spoke about you getting into UCL, you spending your time at UCL. Let's talk about closer to getting out of UCL now. So if I get the next one, it's up there. You've studied for three years, three year course, right? Yeah, studied for three years, four years. You're about to graduate and you're not applying to grad schemes. So your personal tutor must be happy going by this. But you're neither going to master's program, which is also fine, but then you're not even applying for an off cycle internship, which is like backup, backup, backup for everyone. You literally studied in the School of Management where we have 17 year old kids who apply for spring weeks in August, even before UCL commences in September. So you never entered the job market. What were you thinking? Yeah, so when I joined UCL at 18, I kind of, that was the beginning of my spiritual journey. And through my years at UCL, I was just, uh, yeah, exploring that path, having amazing conversations, um, yeah, reading amazing books, 
-hmm. organizing events and meeting people, which was really kind of becoming a disruption in my life. It was disrupting. I was just looking at the TV out there and uh, UCL is known for disruptive thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like all of this spiritual wisdom was disrupting my life because life is normally meant to go in a certain direction. And then I was getting all of this wisdom and it was making me question everything. It was making me question, where do I want to be? What do I want to do? What's my calling? Um, and so, but it was a progressive disruption. Mm. I think there's something in the world which is uh, uncomfortable, but progressive at the same time. And I think that spiritual disruption or progressive disruption, because all of this wisdom, it was making me more awake. It was making me more aware. It was making me more conscious. Mm -hmm. It was forcing me to challenge everything the world had told me to be in terms of what success is. Mm. And so by the time I was kind of 20 and nearing my degree end, naturally I was looking at um, what I would do next. And so the idea of working in the corporate world just didn't move me. Um, in fact, it scared me. <laughs> uh, putting on a suit was like an ordeal for me. And uh, I'll make a confession here today. I did actually have one interview at an internet startup in Holborn for a graduate position just before, about three months before my graduation. And I remember going there in a suit, feeling extremely uncomfortable. Um, I came to the reception. They told me to wait in the foyer while the person came and um, called me for the interview. And as I sat there in the foyer, looking around at the open office, I thought to myself, I don't think this is my future. I don't think this is what I'm meant to be doing. And then I heard some footsteps and I had this moment of existential crisis and I just got up and I left. <laughs> and that was my uh, first and last corporate interview. Wow. And, uh, and then I just decided that after I graduated, I was 21. I just decided that I needed to take some time out. So I went traveling to India and I, uh, I didn't have any money. I had lots of debts, <laughs> as all of you know. And so I, I, I just couldn't conjure up the courage to ask my father for an air ticket to India after he'd spent about 30,000 pounds in a university education for me. So uh, I decided to become a baggage handler at Heathrow Airport for three months. Uh, you know those guys who basically wreck your luggage? Um, <laughs> I was one of those, although I was one of the nice guys. And, uh, and then I got enough money and then I got, an, got a ticket and went to India and I traveled in India for six months. And so that was my uh, graduate scheme, a spiritual journey uh, through the ashrams and holy places of India. And just as you traveled away from UCL, London, that whole theme, we should also travel away from that and now go into deeper stuff, talking about how your last 20 years have been. So you've graduated now. What did you do next? You, of course, mentioned India, but what after? And also, especially, how's the last one year been? Because I believe you changed your order of monkhood. And also explain to us what that means and why you appear this way. Oops. Yes, so after I came back from India, then uh, I had that dreaded moment of going home and having to face my family again and them expecting me to now go into a graduate position. And I think it's something that all of you here and all of us in life have to navigate is the expectations of others because you have loved, loved ones in your life who have contributed so much to your life and who want so much for your life and you want to please them, you want to make them happy. But at the same time, you have your own calling, you have your own journey, you have your own uh, path of discovery. And sometimes navigating those two things isn't always easy. And so somehow or other, I had to had that difficult conversation with my parents and tell them that I didn't think corporate life was for me and that I wanted to pursue monastic life. And, and it was difficult, it was emotional. There were times of doubt, um, but I didn't want to live my life with regrets. 
I felt as though if I didn't follow my calling, then 20, 30 years down the line, I'd look back and have a lot of regrets. And so I, I made that hard decision and I became a full-time monk uh, when I was 21. Uh, we slept on the floor. We fit all our possessions into a single locker. Uh, we'd eat at set times in the day and we'd wake up very, very early um, by four o'clock latest. And life became very, very different. I was uh, meditating every day for two hours. I was studying spiritual wisdom. I was uh, serving, often doing menial things in the monastery, cleaning toilets, uh, uh, washing oh. floors, cooking, cutting vegetables. And I was thinking, wow, I must be the most overqualified person in this monastery. <laughs> um, but it was very nice. It was very humbling and it opened up a lot of headspace. For the first time when I joined the monastery, I realized how fast life is, that sometimes life is so fast paced, life is so chaotic, life is full of so many demands and duties that we don't actually have the headspace to deeply think about uh, what we really want to do with the time we have here. And so I really appreciated that simplicity. Mm. The monks told me monastic life means simple living, high thinking. And then the monk looked at me and he said, in the world nowadays, people are simply living, hardly thinking. Oh. Um, and that kind of resonated with me. So, so I became a young monk, 21. And part of what we would do also is we weren't reclusive monks. So we would still continue to engage with the world. So we'd come out to universities, to corporate firms, to schools, um, and we'd talk to people about spiritual things. And that would lead to discussions, debates, and uh, many, many interesting scenarios. So it was, it was a, a time of great growth for me and uh, spiritual discovery. And, um, and then after living one year as a monk, I kind of went home for a day <laughs> and I said to my mom and dad, I think I need another year. I just need another year to find myself. And I think by this time they were thinking it's going to be longer than a year, but they agreed. And then one year became two, two became five, five became 10. And uh, I've lived as a monk ever since. So yeah, I'm f uh, 41 now. Um, so I've been living as a monk for just over two decades. Um, and this year I took uh, vows of lifelong renunciation. So some people become a monk for a week. We have a course called Be a Monk for a Week, if you want to try it out. Uh, so some people are a monk for a week. Uh, it's open to men and ladies. Some people are monks for uh, a month, a year, some for 10 years. But some monks may decide to make a lifelong uh, commitment to monasticism. And so this year I decided to make that commitment. And uh, so nowadays they call me a Swami. And a Swami means uh, a lifelong monk. And uh, a lifelong monk carries around one of these, uh, primarily for self-defense. <laughs> um, but it's also spiritually symbolic because uh, this is the staff of a renuncia and it contains uh, three bamboo rods. Mm. Bamboo is a beautiful, uh, is a beautiful type of uh, natural resource because bamboo has very deep roots. Okay. And bamboo, when the wind goes through it, it creates a beautiful sound. So the renunciates keep bamboo sticks with them to remind them that they have to be very, very deep. They have to be very reflective and introspective. Mm. And not just that, they should travel the world and try to give the sweet sound of spirituality, positivity and empowerment to the world. Um, so there's three bamboo sticks in here and the three bamboo sticks represent the body, the mind and the words. 
And so the lifelong renunciates hold this with them everywhere they go to remind themselves that this is the purpose of their life, to try to share spirituality with body, minds and words in the spirit of kindness and compassion so people can become the best versions of themselves. Wow. And you know, one thing I took away is that you went to that corporate firm for an interview and walked out. And today, I believe corporate firms call you for fireside chats like this, <laughs> interview you. But anyway, that's the path you took. I still got to prove you a bit more because you know the kind of monastic life you described to me must be very nice for you and happy for you. But I can't live in a monastery to save my life. Like maybe literally just to save my life. But otherwise, I can't. I want to get my econ degree in three months. And obviously the two common pathways are investment banking or consulting. So banking is not for me. I'm, I'm trying to get into consulting, but I kind of like spirituality too, a little bit. We have like our weekly sessions at UCL also. We have a lot of our members here. They can attest to that. But while studying here at uni, you know, I do a little bit here and there. Not everyone can become a monk like you and leave their life behind and go into a monastery and just dedicate themselves to it. Like you said, lifetime renunciation. So how can normal people living in the real world, like like us, uh, kind of be spiritual and also like time management? How do we manage our spiritual and other things kind of going on? Yeah. Well, the first thing is I don't think anyone should be normal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of our monks he used to say, those who are now considered normal accept the values and principles of an insane world. Wow. So we don't want to be normal. We don't want to just fit in the world. We don't want to just um, shoot for all the measures of success that society has set for us without deeply thinking about whether that will actually make us happy. Each of us, uh, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, which is an ancient literature that we uh, kind of hold in very high reverence. Krishna says that every soul is amazing. And Krishna says that every soul, every person has unique talents, has unique abilities, has a unique psychophysical nature. And everyone has their own unique purpose, calling and contribution to make in the world. And so the goal of life is not to become a monk. The goal of life is not just to become successful in the world. The goal of life is to actually find what your unique calling is, what your unique abilities are, and then use that to make the world a better place, use that to make people's lives happier. So not everyone's supposed to be a monk. Einstein said, everyone is a genius, but if you convince a fish that it has to climb a tree, it will live its whole life thinking it's a failure. So everyone has their own path. So for me, monasticism was the path. It was the, the route through which I thought I could make my greatest contribution to the world. But for many of you here, that may not be the path, but that doesn't mean you can make any less of a contribution. You can be an entrepreneur, you can be uh, an architect, you can be an artist, you can be an influencer, you can do whatever you wanna do, but do it to, make the world a better place, do it to make people's lives mm -hmm. happier and healthier. And then it will bring real contentment um, to your heart. Wow, really empowering, thank you. But again, just to follow up on that, monks I've read and I've heard have some really like idealistic kind of principles. Sometimes monks like yourself, your holiness would talk about things like compassion, tolerance, forgiveness, etc. But like in my day to day life, it just feels so, so far out there and impractical to implement. So even though we come across spirituality and spiritual kind of teachings and philosophies, how can that be applied or implemented in our life? Because sometimes it just feels so unreal to day to day existence. These qualities are qualities that all of us can cultivate on a day-to-day -day basis. Compassion means when you're walking down the street and you see someone suffering, you think deeply, what can I do perhaps in this moment or not even maybe in this moment, but what can I do in my life to help people who are going through such pain and difficulty? Hmm. 
Tolerance means when you're in the supermarket and someone jumps the queue in front of you, you don't need to get supermarket rage. You can just accept that some people do things and it's better to keep your peace of mind than get into an argument. Uh, selflessness means that, yeah, sometimes if your little brother needs some help with his homework, then you put your own agenda to one side for a few hours just to help him out. That's selflessness. So these qualities are not utopian qualities. These are qualities that each one of us can begin to implement in small and bigger ways in our life. But the problem is, in the world today, everyone or many people have a to-do list. But how many people have a to-be list? At the end of this life, people won't remember us for what we did. People won't remember us for our achievements. People won't remember us for the, our percentage in a test or our position in a ranking or our power in society. People will remember us for who we were, the qualities that we exuded, the character that we um, cultivated in our life that touched their hearts. And so, what the ancient spiritual teachers tell us is, along with having a to-do list, have a to-be list and ask yourself day to day, what can you do and how can you function in this world to live up to that to-be list? Mm. That sounds practical. Thank you. So one thing which kind of confuses me a lot is that we kind of throw these words around like philosophy, like spiritual, right? Spirituality, etc. When I look at you, just first glance, naked eye, the first word which would come into my mind is religion, right? You're a religious figure. You, you, look, you look like that, I just can't help it. And then also people like you, in like orange robes, etc. also talk a lot about yoga and meditation and stuff. So what's really going on? Are you spiritual? Are you religious? Are you a yogi? What are you about? But I think the first problem in the world today is that these words are all very loaded. Religion conjures up an image of institution. What Marx said is the opium of the people, uh, something used to control and um, herd people into a certain way of living. Sometimes when people hear the word spiritual, they think it's about ghosts or the occult or something metaphysical that's uh, weird and wonderful. When people hear of yoga, they're kind of not sure. They think it's about like exercise or losing weight or maybe controlling the mind, but not quite sure. Whether you're religious, spiritual, or you do yoga, if you look at what the essence of all of these things are meant for, they're actually meant for helping us achieve spiritual connection. Religion comes from the Latin re ligare. Re means again, ligare means to link. So religion literally means that which connects you to divinity. Yoga comes from the Sanskrit word yuj, or what we say in English, yoke, which means to connect together or union. Uh, so yoga means the same. And spirituality means to go beyond the physical, to go beyond the material and to enter into another realm of reality beyond just what we see with our eyes. And so if you look at religion, spirituality, and yoga at their essence, they're talking about the same thing, which is achieving divine connection, finding divine love, awakening our minds with divine wisdom. And uh, these are universal quests that everyone has. Mm -hmm. If you think about every single fairy tale in the world, they all end with the words, and they lived, happily ever after. So everyone wants to live forever. Not just that, everyone wants to be conscious, aware. They want to be, um, yeah, cognizant of things. And not just that, they want to be happy. Mm. But does anyone in this world live happily ever after? It's a fairy tale. But why is that uh, desire within us so strong? because these are actually qualities of the soul. These are actually the deeper spiritual qualities that each one of us embody. So religion, spirituality, yoga, all of these things are ultimately aimed 
at bringing us back to an awareness of this spiritual nature. And so, am I religious? Am I a yogi or am I a spiritualist? Um, I'm, I'm all of them and maybe none of them, depending on how you define it. Wow. That clears a lot of things up and especially like the, the, the origins of the words and everything. But one thing about religion, which personally hurts me or affects me a lot and many people in my generation, like I'm, I'm scared of the word itself because as soon as I hear it, I associate it with stigma, with sectarianism, with discrimination, with rituals, with, with persecution, with war, with societal division. Whereas the picture you kind of painted is, is such a nice sense of divine connection. So why do we, or why has religion ended up in a place where we have to associate such seemingly negative things with the idea of uh, an actually beautiful concept? Anything in this world can be used for good and bad. If you put the knife in the hand of a surgeon, it can save someone's life. Mm -hmm. If you put a knife in the hand of someone with a deviant mentality, it can cost lives. The knife is not inherently good or bad, but it holds the potential of doing something wonderful, provided it's in the hand of a capable and compassionate person. Religion has been misused, but so has money, so has power, so has uh, information. They say ignorance plus power equals dictatorship. Ignorance plus religion equals terrorism. Ignorance plus money equals corruption. You'll see that the common thing in the equation is ignorance, not the actual thing. Hmm. So many people may have misused religion in the world to create division, to create friction, to create conflict to subjugate, to discriminate, to um, create negativity in the world. Yeah. But that doesn't discount the fact that there are other people who have used spiritual teachings to actually awaken harmony, to awaken uh, beauty and love and compassion and community and, uh, and a deeper sense of fulfillment and contentment in the lives of many, many people as a result of spirituality. So I think we should just be careful of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and rather we should be seekers of the essence and try to understand the essence of something and then draw on that and, and try to utilize it for good in our lives. Sure. So when you said the essence, that's like singular right? One word. But there's so many paths out there, so many different religions. So what, what path or what kind of spirituality in specific do you follow? Of course, just by looking at you, I can say you have a favorite color and a particular path you follow. Tell us a bit more about that, what your practices, etc. are, but also whether is it better than the others or is it better at all? Or is it the only path to purpose or to realization in life? Yeah. I don't think I could sit here and tell you that we have a monopoly on spirituality. Uh, I have friends who are Christians. I have good friends who are Muslims. I have good friends in practically all the world faiths. I even have good friends who don't have any belief. They're atheistic. What we would say is that there's a unity and diversity within the religious and spiritual traditions in the world that we see today. Mm. While religions and spiritual paths may differ in ritual, in culture, in expression, when we delve a little bit deeper and we dig a little deeper and we look to the essence of what those religions and spiritual paths are teaching, then we're not going to say they're all the same, but we'll say there are universal, core, um, cardinal principles of reality that each one of them are teaching. So according to the tradition of the East, different religions all appeared in the world at different times, places, circumstances within different situations for the purpose of elevating the people of that time. And therefore they vary slightly on the externals, 
and also on certain theological principles. But in essence, each one of those uh, religious and spiritual paths, if practiced with purity and sincerity, can lead one to higher states of consciousness and a genuine connection with the divine. Mm. So therefore, if someone says that through practicing other religions, they're achieving that divine connection, then we're extremely happy for them and we would, uh, we would encourage them to continue. Um, so then you may say, then why did I practice this? Or why do I practice what I'm practicing? Yeah. Because in my search of uh, spiritual traditions, and I searched uh, different paths, um, for me, the path that I'm currently following, I found to be the path which was the most uh, detailed in its explanation of spiritual reality. Not just that, I found this path to be extremely practical and pragmatic in my own personal life. Hmm. Not just that, I felt as though this path had insights and wisdom which could genuinely uh, create amazing change in the world. And for these reasons, I decided to study this path in more detail. And now it's become my uh, full-time uh, obsession, you could say, because I really feel as though the wisdom that we can gain here is, uh, is what the world really needs. Mm -hmm. In a world that's suffocating from materialism, we really need wisdom that breathes. And this wisdom that I've accessed in this path, I've found to be um, unparalleled in the impact it can have. Very interesting. One thing I, I'd like to hold on to is you mentioned search and find, which essentially means you took some effort to go, around, go about it. But for many people, it's all about accident of birth, right? We have this idea in economics, accident of birth, which means it depends on your family situation, how you were raised, raised in a particular faith or unfaithful family, where you were raised, etc. And also to a large extent, people don't even know where to find answers or they don't question at all. So how does one really even start their spiritual journey or what's missing because so much depends on factors external to us. I think in today's day and age, we're living in a global village. So although cultures are apart, although we're separated by time and space in one sense, the availability of information means we can access all kinds of insights and knowledge if we're desirous to go on that journey. So someone may say, there's so much out there. Where do I start? What, what should I look for? How do I know whether it's this religion or that religion? And my answer to them would be, go on the journey. Go on the journey and explore and see what's out there and see what resonates with you. See what disrupts your life in a positive way and see what you can take hold of and apply in your life that will uplift and elevate the quality of your existence. Mm -hmm. If you imagine all knowledge in the world to be in a circle, then one small part of that circle is what you know. Mm. There's another part of that circle which is slightly bigger, which is what you know you don't know. But you know the biggest part of that circle is what you don't know you don't know. <laughs> okay. And what you don't know, you don't know, you'll never get to know until you first find out what you don't know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I remember that. <laughs> In other words, what I'm saying is that first you have to go out there and explore. There's a world of information out there. There's a world of wisdom. There's a, a treasure house of insights that people have followed for centuries that have given answers. The most amazing life hacks are available, but they're lying dormant because most people in the world are too lazy. They're too lethargic. They're too comfortable. They're too apathetic to explore. Hmm. But when we begin to open and go on that journey, then 
ultimately, we have to trust in that journey that we'll find what we're looking for. But you can't uh, defeat yourself before you've even started. Wow. Thank you. I think we've spoken a lot about spirituality and you know the paths out there, etc. I'd like to kind of circle back to your specific path now. And one thing you mentioned when you were talking about that is uh, when you were promoting the Be A Monk Challenge, you said male or female, so like women as well. And that's one thing which is, you know, a lot on my mind and other people's mind. When it comes to religion or spirituality, don't you think there's a stereotypical sense of an imbalance of power? Because God is a man. These religious teachers or gurus or people in power are men. The authors of books you're supposed to read and you're prescribed to read are men. And well, everybody is supposed to respect and listen to men. So what's the role of, there's some like male supremacy going on here. What's the role of gender when it comes to religion and spirituality? Well, let me just go back to your first point about God being a man. <laughs> oh, God's a woman? Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes people ask me, what do you believe in? And they say, are you a monotheist? And I say, not quite. They say, well, are you a polytheist? I say, not quite. So they say, then what are you? And I tell them, we are polymorphic by monotheists. Yeah, I'll just let that sit with you for a second. <laughs> no, I got that okay. polymorphic by monotheists. Yeah. You translate. So this. the monotheism part means we believe there's one supreme divinity. Yeah. But the bi-monotheism means we believe that supreme divinity has a male and female aspect. Okay. And therefore, whenever we talk about Krishna as the supreme divinity, it's never separated from Radha, who is the female counterpart. Divinity exists with a male and female con counterpart. That's the complete divinity. But then we are polymorphic by monotheists because we believe there's one divinity who has a male and female aspect, but that one divinity then manifests itself in society in multifarious ways. These are known as avatars um, or literally manifestations of the divine. And so uh, actually in our tradition, we don't believe God is just a man. We believe God has a male and female um, aspect and that's the complete divinity. Okay. You talked about only having teachers or men who are gurus, but in our lineages, we have even ladies who are spiritual leaders and who are gurus, oh. that happens. Uh, and in the world we're living in today, we're two men sitting here, but you may well come to another event a few weeks down the line and there could be ladies sitting here because we believe that uh, divinity, everyone can be an instrument of divinity. Everyone can be an instrument of knowledge. The body is a vehicle to do that. And whether that body is a male body or a female body, it's in no way a limitation. Um, it just depends on the purity of that person to convey and become a, 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 a messenger of those teachings. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges for religions and spiritual traditions today is the ability to preserve but adapt. Mm -hmm. We're living in a changing world. We're living with a changing culture. We, uh, society is structured in a different way. And therefore religions somehow have to be able to preserve their principles but adapt according to the cultures and the societies that we live in so that they can remain relevant and dynamic. And so, uh, so we would hope that the spiritual tradition that we're in, I'm sure there's much improvement to make also, but within our spiritual tradition, we try to give equal opportunities um, to everyone. And does that apply to stuff like race, identity, or even like sexuality, for example? Yeah, so we have uh, in our movement, we have people who are in the highest spiritual orders from various uh, cultures across the world. We have uh, African leaders, we have European leaders, we have American leaders, we have Indian leaders. Uh, again, the body is a vessel, the body is an instrument. 
And if the body is attuned to giving spirituality in a pure way, it can no way be a limitation. And so, yeah, we offered that opportunity across the board. Actually, if you look, you'll see that the Hare Krishna movement is perhaps one of the most diverse and cosmopolitan um, movements you'll see in terms of its composition. I love picking on words when you say certain things on my list. You mentioned the word movement. And before also we spoke about organized religion and institutionalism and society. So you're of course a part of a society. How do you retain your individuality and individual relationship with divinity while being a part of that community? And is there, is institution even necessary? Because as you describe, it's all about personal connection. One of our teachers says a spiritual institution is a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. Institutions are evil because it can become about power. It can become about position. It can become about prestige. It can become about popularity. So institutions tend to become decadent over time. Yet institutions are also necessary because when we have company, when we are in a group, then we gain uh, support, encouragement, uh, inspiration. An African proverb says, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. But if you want to walk far, walk with many. Hmm. And so an institution or community is also necessary. So one of our teachers, he gave us the example that a religious institution is like a flowing river mm. and your spirituality is like a boat. So your boat, if it sits upon that river nicely, then that river can take the boat to the destination it's meant to reach. But the moment that river enters into the boat and starts to consume the boat, then it will actually end up sinking the boat. So we live in a religious institution but we have our own spiritual boat that we're um, navigating towards the journey we want to go on. And so the institution is not the be all and the end all, but the institution is something we're interacting with and utilizing in an appropriate way so that we can ultimately achieve divine connection. Thank you. I think throughout this kind of conversation, I've been very liberal with my questions and you've gratefully answered all of them and I'm going to just pick on that theme of questions and answers and one observation from my own life and I believe many here will agree is that well we've all had questions in our life growing up but the people we ask those questions have more often than not told us to just believe it for the sake of it right and that's why we eventually get disillusioned because it doesn't make sense then comes the whole idea of superstition for, for blind faith, stuff like that. So when people who are supposed to know the answers, so-called men and women of God, or even parents, elder people in society, etc., either don't know the answers or don't give us the answers when we ask them, are we just getting lies from society all the time? And if we do genuinely want to get answers, who do we ask? The first thing is when we teach the Bhagavad Gita in the world, we don't teach it as a religious faith. Mm -hmm. The culmination of spirituality is not faith. Faith is simply the beginning. The Bhagavad Gita we teach to the world as a spiritual science. In other words, when you open these books of wisdom, they give you a certain hypothesis of reality, that you're a spiritual being, that there's a supreme spirit. But not just that, these books give you an experiment. They give you tools, practices, lifestyle, uh, a way of living that can help you to achieve that connection. And not just that, these books also give you the observation. They tell you what kinds of things will happen when you achieve this divine connection. In other words, this is not a religion. This is not a faith. This is not something you just have to believe in till your end of your life and then at the end close your eyes and hope you did the right thing. No, this is a science. You can prove it. You can experience it. You can perceive it. But in order to perceive it, you have to perform the experiment. You have to become a spiritual scientist. You have to go on the journey of trying to implement higher dimensional science in your life. 
And if you do that, divinity doesn't just have to be something you can, you, you're believing in, but divinity is something that you're dynamically perceiving and interacting with at every moment in your life. Hmm. So Sorry. become a spiritual scientist. <laughs> and what is that experiment? The Bhagavad Gita is essentially a book of yoga. So we mentioned yoga. Mm -hmm. And yoga means union or connection or linking. So within the yoga uh, philosophy, there are certain practices of meditation. There are certain practices of introspection and prayer. There are certain lifestyle habits and character traits, which if you implement in your life, begins to purify and uplift your consciousness so that you're able to perceive higher aspects of reality. And that's the spiritual experiment. And that's open to everyone. And it's something everyone can try. There was an American psychologist, his name was William James. And he talked about something called live options. So he said, in life, there are many options of things you could do, but not all options are live options. He said, for something to be a live option, number one, it has to be beneficial. It has to give you some benefit in your life. Number two, a live option is something which is probable. In other words, people have done it and they're experiencing that benefit. And the third thing, he said, a live option should be practical. You can do it in your life without having to make major changes or risk or sacrifice anything. Mm. When we come out to the world, we tell people, you don't have to believe what we're saying, but this is a live option. It's giving you the offer of a great benefit to find inner contentment, to overcome the, the negativity of your own mind, to find your calling and contribution. What an amazing benefit. But not just that, it's probable. There are people who have practiced these teachings and are experiencing this, but not just that, is practical. You don't have to change your life. You don't have to turn your, you don't have to become a monk. You can, if you like, we've got vacancies. <laughs> um, go on with your life. You can practice and you just add bits of spirituality. So William James, he said, there are certain things in life which are live options. And if something is a live option, it's beneficial, it's probable, it's practical, you would be mad he actually says this, you would be mad not to at least investigate it because you have nothing to lose, but you have everything to gain. So if you irrationally just throw that out without um, exploring it, then that would indicate an irrational predisposition to blindly doubting something. Mm. So our message as spiritual disruptors. That's my new job title, by the way. <laughs> we're spiritual disruptors. We're trying to come into the world and we're trying to share with people. Mm. Become a scientist. Become an explorer. Disrupt your life. Challenge it. Don't just accept what the world has told you. Because if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough, that lie becomes a so-called truth. If enough people accept that truth, it becomes a culture. And if that culture is transmitted from one generation to another, it becomes a tradition. And then people are born into that tradition and they set up their life according to that tradition, which is actually based on the so-called culture, which is based on a so-called truth, which is actually a lie. Wow. But no one can uncover that lie unless you're willing to embrace spiritual disruption. And that means you gotta be brave because the most dangerous phrase in the English language is we've always done it this way. Mm. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh -huh. No, off topic, I'm so glad this is getting recorded because I need to remember all of what you've said. Like, what was the first one? Polymorphic, bi monotheism, monotheism. And then this whole lies, truth, culture, tradition thing. But no, thank you for that. 
We're going to open up to audience questions soon. I'm nearing the end of my list. I also have a few questions from you. You send me in advance, so I've kept that saved. But we've spoken a lot about the world, other faiths, traditions, spirituality as a whole, etc. A little bit about you and getting to know you as a person as well as relating with you and our lives. So we'll just take this quickly, five, six kind of rapid questions and then open up to the audience. One is, well, you're a monk, you do everything right. Now we, of course, feel a lot of stress, anxiety, insecurity all the time. But you must be always happy or do you feel down as well? When you go to hospital and they put you on one of those machines, like what they call it, ECG, echocardiogram. Mm -hmm. If your lifeline is like that, that's not good news. Because that means you're finito. <laughs> A lifeline means it's always like this. Mm. Life means ups and downs. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you practice. Life means ups and downs. So even monks have downs. Even spiritual people have difficult times. Even those who embrace the divine path, difficult things happen to them. We're not going to turn around and say, everything that happens is good. But what we are going to say is that it's not that everything that happens is good, but something good can come from everything that happens. And so in the downs, in the difficulties, in the pains and the problems of life, Monks and spiritual people learn how to rise, how to learn, how to evolve and how to grow from those situations. They learn the art of how to turn pain into progress, how to turn problems into purpose. And therefore, downs are a, also a, a great part of life. They're not an easy part of life, but no pain, no gain. But you have to learn the art. And do you learn that art in university? Do you learn the art of how to turn pain into purpose, problems into progress? Do you learn how to navigate the roller coaster journey of life? That you don't learn in an academic education. Mm. That you have to learn from the spiritual disruptors <laughs> because they come and teach another way in which to react and respond to the roller coaster journey of life. That's why you're here today teaching us. Thank you. You mentioned downs and how to recover or bounce back from them. That's more an after the fact kind of thing. But many times one thing which really troubles us, me, I can speak for myself, is, the, is not only failure itself after it's happened, but looking forward to something I'm doing, the fear of failure, the possibility of failure in certain actions I need to do. Because basic performance orientation and wanting good outcomes requires that I need to work amazingly well, but there's always that kind of sense of potential failure hanging. Right? So how do you deal not only, you, you mentioned how to deal with failure after it happens, but how to deal with the possibility of failure in what you're doing here and now? Before we talk about failure, first we have to know what is success. If people have the wrong definition of success, then they will also have the wrong definition of failure. According to spiritualists, success is not in the result. Success is not in the achievement. Success is not what you, you get at the end. That's not what defines success. According to spiritual teachings, success is in your endeavor, your intention, your effort, the character that goes behind the noble thing that you're trying to do. And once you've invested all of those things, whatever the result may be, is actually inconsequential. It's already a success. Because in reality, none of us are in control of the result. There are other factors in the universe beyond our control, which are affecting the results that we gain. So therefore, if you try to measure success by results, not only will you feel a failure, but you'll also be inhibited of even going on the journey for fear of failure. Mm. But when you understand that success is in the effort, the goal of life is not to be the best. 
the goal of life is to try your best. And in trying your best, if it's destiny's plan for you to be the best for the purpose of service and making the world a better place, then so be it. Mm -hmm. And if destiny's for your plan is not for you to be the best, it doesn't matter, you're still a success. Uh -huh. In the Bhagavad Gita, this is known as karma yoga or the art of working, the art of detached work. Mm. And this is the most, one of the most powerful things that people can use in their life because in this world, people are so stressed. People are so uh, deflated, demoralized and depressed because they measure success in the wrong way. When we measure success in the wrong way, we fall to the cancers of the mind, competing with others, comparing with others. But you're on your own journey and you only need to do your best. Mm. And that is success. Wow. One thing I want to be successful in is relationships. This came on popular demand. So <laughs> He's going to ask a monk about love. <laughs> yeah. No, he, a monk here is, of course, a renunciant. You're a celibate as well. But everybody wants to know what's your relationship advice. And that's my last question, promise. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. There was a king and he wanted his young son, the prince, to become the successor. So he said, before you become the successor and you become the king, I want you to go to the forest. And for one year, I want you to just listen. So the prince went into the Ming Li forest and he sat there in the lotus position, listening with eyes, uh, ears open. He came back after a year and his father, the king, said to the young prince, what did you hear? He said, I heard, the, I heard the birds chirping. I heard the rain falling. I heard the leaves rustling. His father looked at him and he said, go back. Go back for another year and listen more intently. And he was thinking, I listened intently. There was nothing else to hear in the forest. But he went back for two months, three months, four months. All he could hear, the birds chirping, the water falls, the leaves rustling. He thought, what more am I supposed to hear? And then after six months, he began hearing more. He began hearing what he had never heard before. He began uh, perceiving things that he had never perceived before. And after a year, he came back and his father said, what did you hear? He said, I heard the birds chirping. I heard the leaves rustling. I heard the water falling. And his father came forward and he said, did you hear anything else? And he said, I also heard the sound of the flowers opening, the sound of the earth seeping up the morning dew, the sound of the love of the mother for her children. And his father looked at the prince and said, now you're qualified to lead because you've learned the art of how to hear the unheard. When you relate to people, don't just relate to their acts. Don't just relate to their words. Don't just respond to their facial expressions, but try to see what's behind it. What's the hidden story? What are the emotions? What are the feelings? What are the desires that they haven't communicated to you that's causing them to act the way they're acting? When you learn to hear the unheard, then you hold the key to having a deeper relationship, whether it be man and woman, parent and child, friends. The key is to hear the unheard, to hear the heart and to seek to uh, really understand someone and what's going on behind what they necessarily communicate to you. Thank you. And I think my relationship with the audience will be hearing their heart and now opening it up. So if I have my colleague there with the mic um, and anybody, if you'd like to 
ask, you can just feel free to raise your hand. I will potentially pick on you and then your mic will arrive. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, I was just wondering how you could distinguish whether your calling was in fact a calling and not just you running away in fear of a regular lifestyle. Wonderful, thank you so much. Firstly, I just want to apologize because I realized that probably throughout this talk, I hardly looked here because I was just, they put the seat this way, so. <laughs> I only looked there, <laughs> but I don't compensate. <laughs> <laughs> you, you compensated for me. Uh, thank you so much. How do we know that we're not running away? Um, let me share this with you. I think there's a difference between walking away from something and running away from something. When you walk away from something, your consciousness is focused on the thing you're moving away from, the fear, the anxiety, the overwhelming uh, difficulty of dealing with that. And when you're running away from it, sorry, so when you're running away from something is focused on that. But when you're walking away from something, your focus is the great thing, the, the beautiful thing, the more positive thing that you're trying to reach. And so I think there's a type of renunciation which is out of frustration. And there I think there's a type of renunciation which is based on an exploration. And so for me, although the modern world and that way of functioning didn't resonate with me, I feel for me, that was not what was driving my journey towards renunciation. That wasn't the predominant thing. What was more driving me in my journey to renunciation was the great opportunities that were awaiting me on the horizon if I walked this path. So I think if we're running away from something, then we're trying to escape problems. But when we're walking away from something, we're giving up one situation because we want to explore what else is on the horizon. And so in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that there are different types of renunciation. And if you renounce out of frustration, then that won't lead you to your calling. But when you renounce something because there's something much better you're trying to aim for, then that will lead you to your calling. I don't know if that, you can follow up on that if you like. I think many, oh yeah, sorry. I, I just think many people feel overwhelmed by how much, like w about consumption, about the uh, stress you were talking about, we, about the stressful lifestyle we tend to live. So I think many people could turn to want to do something more simple, more minimalistic in life, just in fear of the o overwhelmness of the other lifestyle so yeah perhaps that's a way someone can distinguish whether they are running away or walking away from that yeah thank you thank you perhaps someone from this side now balance it out oh wow <laughs> i saw your hand got up first the gentleman with the jacket uh, thank you so much uh, yeah uh, i have many 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 questions but i would keep my excitement uh, to give you this chance. Um, my question is very clear on beginner's meditation. So when uh, few of us try to meditate in the very early phases, uh, we are usually distracted. We sit for 20 minutes with closed eyes, 30 minutes, and yet uh, for a fraction of a second, we are in that zone, and then suddenly we are out of and we are thinking, uh, thinking of something else. and. I don't know, it now hits back in while you are in sitting there. So how would you suggest we get into deeper and deeper meditations, even for shorter periods? Thank you so much. Well, let me share a little Sanskrit verse with you. This is something Krishna says to Arjun. A major portion of the Bhagavad Gita is dealing with the mind. It's amazing, 5,000 years ago, Krishna dedicated a whole chapter of the Bhagavad Gita to the mind. And now we're living in the 21st century and the mind has become the biggest talking point of modern medicine. Negativity, stress and more acute states like depression and these things are attacking everyone. 
And we all experience how difficult the mind is. Once I was driving and there was a car and it said, do not disturb, already disturbed. <laughs> so our world is like that. So this is what Krishna says to Arjun when Arjun says, my mind, he says, Krishna, I think my mind to control it is more difficult than controlling the wind. So what does Krishna say to Arjun? And I'll say it in Sanskrit because it's nice to get a bit of Sanskrit. Yato yato nischalati manaschan chalamastiram tatastato niyam yetad atman yeva vasam nayet. Krishna says, Yato yato nischalati. When you're meditating, from wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering nature, Atman Yeva Vasam Nayet, keep bringing it back. Now, this sounds uh, very simple. The art of focusing is that you have to just keep refocusing. People have a romantic idea of meditation that I'm going to sit down, I'm going to cross my legs, I'm going to close my eyes. And within a few moments, I'm going to be levitating. And maybe within an hour, <laughs> I'll reach the other realm of the divine transcendent reality. Uh, didn't always happen like that. Meditation is a discipline. Meditation means your mind will wander. When Krishna looks at Arjuna, he doesn't say, maybe if you find your mind wandering, then but he says, your mind will wander. Just keep bringing it back. I'll tell you an amazing fact. When a plane flies from Heathrow to LA, when the pilot's on the ground at Heathrow, he's given or she's given a flight path. When the plane takes off, it lines itself with that flight path. But shall I tell you something amazing? In any given flight, do you know for how much of the flight the plane is actually on the flight path? Only about 30%. Most of the time, the plane is either on the right-hand side or the left-hand side because there's wind, there's other climatic factors, there's other planes. It's never quite on the line. But after 10 hours, 12 hours, the plane reaches its destination. Why? Because the pilot is always trying to come back to the flight path. So don't seek perfection in meditation but just seek discipline of trying to continually bring your mind back and then you will gain control over your mind. You will gain more serenity, more peace, and you'll reach your destination of divine connection. So we need to go out with the kind of modern, uh, you know, cosmetic and romantic idea of meditation and realize it's a practice, it's a discipline, but it's uh, very beautiful for those who have perseverance and patience. Uh, one last question, which is many of us might relate to, well, maybe not, but uh, it's in- That's a good justification so, for asking another question. <laughs> so you said that you renounced, uh, like you started um, monastic life uh, after completing your bachelor's, right? So you were in a debt. How did you convince, like, how on earth can you convince your Gujarati parents? Like, mommy, papa, mara jau che sant banwa. Not at all possible, right? Just the translation, that means mom and dad, I want to go. <laughs> yeah, so really tough. And I tried to talk to my parents about that and they never let me go to Haridwar or anything. Like, they sent me directly to London. So. Uh, the simple answer to that is, I didn't convince them, <laughs> I just did it. And that was such a difficult decision. But you know why I did it? Because I knew in the long term, it would be my greatest service to them. That although it now it's difficult emotionally, down the line, they'll actually reap the benefits of what I'm doing. And it will actually be the greatest service I can do to them. Managing expectations in this world is not easy. 
So sometimes we have to make difficult choices. We don't do that whimsically. We don't do it insensitively. We don't do it um, capriciously. But when we realize that there's something I have to achieve in this world and it's going to ultimately make everyone's life more beautiful, you have to be able to embrace the disruption in your life that's going to go with that. Because in this world, if a path doesn't have any obstacles, be very sure that it probably doesn't lead anywhere significant. And so whatever path you're going to choose in this world, whether it be to be a monk or whether it be to be an entrepreneur or whether it to be to contribute to the world in another spiritual way, there are going to be obstacles. There are going to be difficult conversations. There are going to be relationships which may be strained. But you can't take your eyes off the goal. You have to keep moving forward. And every story hopefully ends with a happy ending. And the happy ending is my folks are pretty happy now with what I do. But it, it took a couple of decades. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sacrifice. Thank you. Well, before the next question, I just want to say His Holiness has agreed to be here on stage after the event and answer any follow-ups or private questions directly. We're just conscious of time. If we could keep questions short, answers short and no follow-ups, just so that we can get more and more people to ask. So I'm looking for hands again now. Wow. <laughs> Maybe uh, the lady in the beige there. Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing your wisdom with us. I studied uh, education at UCL and I found what I learned from those curriculum is kind of chaotic and uh, divided knowledge rather than, it's more like kind of uh, games of thoughts rather than the ultimate answers of life meaning. Uh, and second, as educational practitioner, I have uh, educated English back at China for, for 10 years. I realized we could hardly change anyone, even ourselves, because they kind of have their own karma to follow. Uh, my question is how to deal with this kind of this question and I kind of feel like after graduation I will uh, come back to China and study at monk school to find the true me and the ultimate meaning of life. Thanks. Thank you so much for your question. I can't speak for everyone's experience at university and this is definitely not a reflection of UCL, probably a re reflection of me. But I was a little disappointed at university because I felt after university that most of the academic institutions of this world, they're not teaching you how to think, they're teaching you what to think. So much of academic study nowadays is just about memorizing information, about cramming things in about just following a protocol and going through a conveyor belt of jumping through certain hoops to get what you need to get at the end. And in the end, you kind of think at the end of all of that, did I really learn how to think? Did I learn how to introspect, how to challenge, how to look at things from different angles of vision? So when I came out of university, I was a little disappointed because I felt as though University is about learning critical thinking, but I didn't feel like I learned that. And that was part of the reason why I became a monk, to, to learn that critical thinking, to be able to challenge. So I think, uh, yeah, this ability to think, to challenge, is uh, something that we have to push ourselves to do. I don't think you can rely on anyone else to do that for you now in today's day and age. And I think that's where you have to become an inquisitive person, a searcher, a questioner. Einstein said, never stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. So we have to become uh, chronically curious because that curiosity is what awakens deeper purpose, a deeper why. 
a deeper understanding of reality. And just on your other point about changing and how sometimes you feel we can't change because we have a certain karma or a certain way in which we're hardwired. I can definitely relate to that. And many of us may feel like that, that can I really change? Can I really become a different person? It just seems like I am who I am. But what the Bhagavad Gita explains is that life is an interplay of karma and free will. So yes, we all come into this world with a certain karma. We're all wired in a certain way. We're dealing with certain psychophysical uh, configurations. Yet within that, we have free will. We have the ability to design a future destiny and we can change, but that change requires firstly, deep thinking. Secondly, application and discipline of practice. Um, and thirdly, uh, spiritual help to break out of patterns of thinking that the world has boxed us into. So if we embrace that process, then we can change. And um, for whatever it's worth, one of the things that gives me the greatest faith in my spiritual path is the transformation that has been generated through this spiritual practice. When I look at who I was 20 years ago, it was funny, we were in the quad today and I was just sitting on a, on a bench that I used to sit in 25 years ago as a university student, sitting in exactly the same spot. And it was one of those moments where you think, who was I 25 years ago? And who am I now? How have I changed? How have I progressed? And uh, I had two stark realizations. One was that um, I got a long way to go. <laughs> But the other one was that I've actually come very far. I've come far because I've changed. And why have I changed? Because the spiritual practice is able to create transformation on such a deep level, but it requires discipline and dedication. Thank you. Thank you. I think time wise, we'll take three more. That's okay. Awesome. So, multiple of three hands got raised, but perhaps you there? Uh, yeah, thank you for all your beautiful words tonight. You mentioned the Bhagavad Gita a few times in your responses, and something that I've always wondered about that text is all this incredible wisdom is revealed on a backdrop of a battle. And I was always wondering how to think about that. So I was wondering what's your interpretation of why it's this... Uh, back up of a battle that this wisdom is revealed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Spiritual literature can be understood on three levels. It's literal, it's didactical, but it's also metaphorical. So the Bhagavad Gita and the battlefield of Kurukshetra is a literal, it's a literal event, it's a historical event. You can go to that place today and it's something that happened in eons ago. But not just that, the Bhagavad Gita is didactical. So the lessons that are taught on the battlefield are lessons that we need to learn. The questions that Arjun asks are the questions that we'll all ask at some point in our life. But spiritual literature is also metaphorical. And that means the battlefield on which the Bhagavad Gita was spoken is also a metaphor of our own life. Because this world is a battlefield. There's so many challenges, there's so many disappointments, there's intrigue, there's twists and there's turns, there's enemies and there's friends, there's good influences and there's negative influences. And so when we begin thinking of life as a battlefield, then we begin to become more wise, more savvy, more aware and alert about how we're navigating our journey through this place. Oftentimes we make a kind of, uh, we take life very lightly, not realizing that we're actually living in a very acute place. On a battlefield, someone could die at any moment. 
That's the reality of life. But do we live with that kind of urgency? Steve Jobs, he said, every day when I wake up, I think to myself, if this was the final day I had on earth, would I be doing what I'm doing today? And if I say no for too many days in a row, then I know I need to change something. It's interesting how he said that death is life's greatest change agent. When you're in a battlefield, death is a reality because you're seeing it. But when we live on the battlefield of the world, we almost live in kind of uh, the ignorance of the danger and the volatility of our own life and therefore complacency and uh, laziness and lethargy overtake us because we don't realize how valuable time is. So when you think of the battlefield of the Bhagavad Gita as the battlefield of life, when you realize this is a battlefield, then your life becomes so much more meaningful because you uh, develop that urgency, that purpose, that awareness, that sensitivity to your environment which helps you do amazing things. Awesome. Anyone else? Um, so thank you for the session. It was like really wise. Uh, I wanted to ask like, um, do you believe in manifestations or is it like everything is written for a person, everything is trying to happen and that's why it's happening for him? Or is it like we can manifest things and like realize them into a, a physical life? Years ago, there was a famous book called The Secret written by Rhonda Byrne, where she felt she had found uh, the secret, the law of attraction, that the, end, the, the universe is vibrating at a certain energy and uh, whatever energy we're vibrating at, we can attract anything in this world. The Bhagavad Gita says there is a sense in which we have power over our future. As I mentioned previously, we have free will. We have the power to design our own destiny. But we also have to realize that we're working within certain limitations because of karma from previous life. So basically, life is an interplay of fate and free will. Certain things in life are destined and those things we can't change. Like some people are just never going to be good singers. It don't matter how many singing lessons they get. It's just not going to happen in this life. But there are other things which you can change, other things which you can develop, other things which through your free will, your discipline, your endeavor, your determination, your effort, you can cultivate. And so uh, manifesting and creating and designing your destiny is very much possible, but we have to realize that um, it's not a free reign. There's a sense in the world of modern self-development when they say you can be whatever you want to be. But what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita is not that you can be whatever you want to be, but you can be everything that you're meant to be. And in that sense, we believe there is manifestation according to uh, the path that you're meant to take in this life. Uh, you mentioned karma yoga uh, towards the end and my question was uh, in the Gita obviously it says uh, quite a lot that our actions we should our karma we should try and do everything for Krishna um, it's a practical question it's I think well all of us are uni students what does that actually mean for someone who is a student how do we for example I'm an economic student I want to go into the corporate world maybe stereotypically but what how do I do that for Krishna or maybe does Krishna not want me to do that? What does it mean to connect your activities in a spiritual cause? Say, for example, if you go on to work in the corporate world. It's very practical. Tomorrow, if you become an investment banker, uh, good luck. <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> no, it's good. You can be a spiritual investment banker. How? Well, the first thing you get when you work in the world is you get money. 
So can you use that money for a good cause? Can you use that money and give it in charity to uplift others? That kind of generosity, that kind of giving of the fruits of your activities means you begin to spiritualize your work. But not just that, as an investment banker, you gain certain knowledge and certain insight into how the world functions. Can you use that in service? Can you use that to help projects which are meant to make the world a better place? Then it becomes spiritual. As an investment banker, you meet people every single day, probably people that monks would have no access to. Can you share spirituality with the people you meet by being a good example, by emanating positivity, by opening their minds, by being a spiritual disruptor in their life? If you can, then you become a spiritual investment banker. So when you work in the world, there are all of these amazing things that you get. And all you have to do is try to utilize them in service. Finding your purpose is useless if you don't use it in service. If someone says my purpose is to become the most rich, successful, and uh, powerful investment banker in the world, full stop. I'm sorry, that's not purpose. But if you say, I want to become the most powerful, influential, rich investment banker in the world so I can use it to make the world a better place, that's purpose. So use your career, use your knowledge, use your understanding of how this world functions to make this world a better place. And that's Karma Yoga. Thank you very much. Okay, final question here from the lady here. She raised her hand even before I asked. So. <laughs> um, so I read once somewhere that you are not a human being meant to be spiritual. You are a spiritual being living this human being miracle. So I guess just to end it, what next post-human? Where's the spirit going? They say there's a new restaurant in town. It's called Karma. But there ain't no menu. You get what you deserve. <laughs> <laughs> Where next? Depends what we do here. Depends what desires you cultivate. It depends what activities you perform. It depends uh, how far you spiritually evolve and what lessons you need to evolve you further on the journey. According to all of those things, at the time of death, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, the soul goes to another destination, in another place, in another body, in another community, with a different set of relationships, because that's the place from which you're going to learn more lessons to evolve yourself and continue on on the journey. So we all came into this world from different places. The whole world is a transit lounge. We all came from different places. Here we all are in this room together for some time. And then eventually we'll all leave and we'll all go in our own destinations. And our destination is dependent upon our activities, our desires and our own spiritual evolution. So the most amazing thing in the world is that people plan for what they're going to do in five years, for what they're going to do in 10 years, for what they're going to do in 20 years. But no one plans for what's going to happen to them after they leave this world. And the most amazing thing is that the only sure thing in this world is that we are going to die. So therefore, a wise person, if they say they're in love with life, then they'll also consider what happens after this life so that they can uh, find what they're really looking for. And I'll end with a quote by C.S. Lewis, the Christian philosopher who said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience of this world can fulfill, then I must conclude I was made for another world. So who's taking that journey to the other world where we can experience 
cognizance, love, happiness, eternity. That's the spiritual person. But in order to take that journey, there's going to be some disruption in your life. And if you embrace that disruption, it will lead to incredible progression. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Your Holiness, as we kiss the Swami. What do you think?